All right, I think it's important to start by recognizing the people whose land we're holding this summit. The Tahana Autumn people are the ancestral owners of this land, and they're the ancestors of the Hohokam or Huhugam. And what we know about these people is that they are phenomenal desert dwellers. In fact, Tahana Adam means desert people, and they're great agriculturalists. They're also known to be sort of for their incredible uh, level of peacefulness. Uh, they allowed travelers and settlers to pass through with unabated. And uh, later, those people were joined by the Peeposh, who actually give us the name of this county, Maricopa. And so the, the combination of those peoples are the, the people that make up this Gila River community. And so I want to start by honoring those people. <clears throat> now, who here knows the five seas of Arizona? The reason ostensibly why people start moving here, turn the last century, just yell it out. Climate. Cattle, climate, Cattle. copper, Cattle. citrus, Cattle. citrus Cattle. cotton, right. Conscious capitalism, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you five bucks later, yeah. <clears throat> Cattle, copper, cotton, citrus, climate. So out of those five, four of those fundamentally interceded in my life. The one that didn't is cattle, even though my name is Cody, I'm not much of a cowboy. Uh, I have parents that are hippies, so it's a different kind of Cody. But <clears throat> so those four, <laughs> I grew up in the middle of cotton country, just a little bit to the southeast of here, and bordering that property was a bunch of citrus orchards that went on for miles and miles and miles. And so what's sort of amazing about living in the middle of a cotton field is that several months of the year, it's a foot deep irrigated, flood irrigated, and the same thing with the citrus orchards. And all of that land, all of that cotton, all that citrus is enabled to be grown by our climate, which is defined by lots of sunlight and quite dry. And of course, wouldn't be possible without all of that water. Of course, that's juxtaposed against when I was a kid, we'd go hiking in the Sonoran Desert across this uh, sort of amazing austere environment, and you'd hike to a spring or a small creek, and it's a sort of this riparian environment would pop up due to that small amount of water. It's cottonwoods and cattails and birds and so on. And yet, back home, there's this like foot deep water. And the recognition that later in life, as I, as I grew up and understood better why that was, over the last 2,000 years, the Native Americans have had hand dug 20,000 kilometers of canals across the land, enabling that agriculture. And it wasn't until much later that those were deepened and widened and cemented in that enabled agribusiness to come into play. But we were certainly not the first people of that land, but that land was enabled and that ecosystem was built by people uh, in, a, in an unstructured way, enabling that agriculture because of, of um, uh, that water that was brought. <clears throat> and so I then went on to do a material science degree at ASU, and the first, there you go, the first, material science or ASU? ASU, okay, all right. <laughs> Just trying to figure out how specific we were getting. <clears throat> so at, at ASU, you know, so uh, the first material scientists in the world were the humans of the Bronze Age, which took copper and tin, combined them to make, make bronze. And so sort of, again, that, that kid coming out of the copper state becoming a material scientist. As I left there, went to MIT to do a PhD and was thinking about renewable energy. Here I grew up in this place with all of this solar intensity, you know, summers that are 120 degrees and sort of sunburn in a few minutes and so on. And, and there was a sort of opportunity at that time, it was still too early for solar to be economically feasible, but it was clear that technically it was feasible, and that there was this massive amount, like a kilowatt per square meter of solar insulation on this planet. It's amazing. So I started working on the materials behind uh, renewable energy, and as I left there, I was headed to the Bay Area because I wanted to build technologies that could go change the world, and at that time, a little over 15 years ago, Michael Crow had just come to ASU. Again, hit it. Yeah. Um, and so they started recruiting me to come back. And so I didn't really want to be a traditional academic. I wanted to, as I said, go change the world. And the challenge, of course, is that academics basically do the stuff of the bench and then they publish a paper and then they move on. And what I wanted to do was basically take stuff of the bench, move it to the market, and then go change the world. And so it turned out that Michael Crow 
this seemingly crazy idea 15, 16 years ago that you could take a number one party school for the last previous 30 years and turn it into a fine research institution. Uh, it turns out that he was right, that he could do that. And uh, it's been one of the, the great uh, decisions of my life to, to move back here to do that. And <coughs> as we got going inside the research group, we were thinking really about renewable energy in the way that all of us think about renewable energy, typically as electricity, solar, wind, and so on. But the reality is that there is this nexus of energy, water, and food. And who, where else on the planet is the balance of energy, water, and food ever more on display than here in Arizona, where there is massive amounts of free energy coming from above, water predicates everything, and we have the, the salad bowl of the country in, in the Yuma area, and a massive amount of, historically at least, citrus being grown here. And so, <coughs> as we went forward, we built a, a battery company, and then as that grew, started to think uh, again about this idea that, that renewable energy was gonna change the world. But yet, only about 20% of all the energy that humans use is, is in the form of electricity. And so if we really want to halt climate change, if we really wanna change our unsustainable ways into something fundamentally sustainable, what we need to do is start thinking about the other 80%, which is the stuff we buy, the food we eat, which is like 30% of all of our energy, it's insane, and the water we drink. And I would argue that the scarcest resource on the planet is good drinking water. And so we started thinking about how could we translate the concepts of renewable energy into water. And why we'd wanna do that is because there are over two billion people on this planet that don't have access to good water. That accounts to one person dying from water bill illness every 10 seconds on this planet. Think about that for a minute, just in the short time that I've been, sp been speaking. Half of every hospital bed on this planet is occupied by somebody with waterborne illness, and in Africa alone, girls and women spend 40 billion hours a year fetching. Think about the loss of productivity, loss of being able to be educated and so on that is associated with that. In the U.S., it's easy to talk about the others, right, those outside of the U.S. We're, we're exceptional, we're here in the U.S. Well, not so much. Right, 21, people, 21 million people drink contaminated tap water every single year. That's associated with 750 water main breaks a day in the U.S. In the time of one mortgage, we need to replace over $2 trillion worth of pipes. And that's not the rest of all the water infrastructure. It's just like to keep it from all leaking out. On average today, about 20% of all the potable water we make in our municipalities leaks out today, 20%. And there are about a little over a million miles of lead pipes left. And in the state of Arizona, over 190 schools have tested for lead above the EPA limits. And by 2030, we'll have about 60% of the fresh water we need to continue on the path we're on. So what can we do to change that? So the company I'm currently building, Zermass Water, the principle is Think about the paradigm of what solar panels enable. It's sort of obvious now to us because we're sort of used to it, but think about what it really means. You take this object and you put it in the sun and power comes out of it. That's a fundamental shift. And you think about the, the supercomputer I have in my pocket, about 10 years old now, this smartphone. There are five billion of these now on the planet, so every single human either own, knows somebody or owns a smartphone. And so over the last 10 years, information poverty has gone like this. Who would have predicted that? Over the last 10 years, solar has gotten cheaper by a factor of 10. So energy poverty is going like this. Who would have predicted that? And yet, if anything, water poverty is going like this because of climate change, because of infrastructure breakdown, because of pollution, et cetera. And so we were really thinking about how could we take those principles and cut the cord, if you will, on water? So think about the, w the fact is like all of the water and all the glasses and all the <coughs> bottles of water here, uh, the, if you think about where that water came from, right? Do you have an answer for where it came from? What is the supply chain behind that water? Well, you know the beginning of it was it rained out of the sky and then soaked into the ground and then it was pumped and treated and sent down a concrete pipe to your house. So you're kind of in the Roman era. And we just put it in a plastic bottle to 
do things to the ocean. So <coughs> is there a way that we could take that and break that and make that independent of infrastructure entirely? And so what we set out to do was take sunlight and air alone to perfect water for every person, every place. Because even in the air that I'm holding in my hand here, right, even here in the Sonoran Desert, there's a tremendous amount of water vapor in this air. And so after a lot of effort with material scientists, chemical engineers, computational fluid dynamicists, machine learning experts, and so on, we developed source hydro panels, which take sunlight and air and make water, quite literally. And so it looks a little bit like a thicker solar panel. And the way this thing works is everybody's sort of seen, you know, the dew formation on the outside of a glass of water, right? So that's just condensation. Everybody's seen water dripping off your air conditioning unit. So nothing special about taking water from air. But if you were to do it that way, what a hugely energy intensive thing, pretty inefficient and wouldn't uh, actually solve the problem. Not to mention all the stuff that grows on cold, wet surfaces. So what we do is actually much more similar to, um, think about like when you have a sugar bowl at home and you leave the lid off, what happens to that sugar? It gets kind of clumpy, wet, you know, et cetera. So what's happening there is the sugar is actually absorbing water from the atmosphere. So you can imagine now a, an engineered material, a nanostructured hygroscopic material that does that process really fast and passively like sugar. And then we use sunlight to respire the water back off those materials, and then we use additional technologies to basically ensure that under any condition, we're creating conditions inside the panel that are like when you step outside of your house and you've got dew on leaves because something magical happened at night that isn't maybe totally clear, but something happened where all of a sudden you're making liquid water out of the, out of the air, right? And so we're able to recreate that condition even here in the desert when it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit and extraordinarily dry. So we're now installed in communities. This is a community in Australia supporting water for them. There's a little boy named Martin on the island of Tana in Vanuatu. Uh, Cyclone Pam took out the water infrastructure for his family and the village, and so we installed an array, and as you can see, Martin's quite a cute little kid, and he's got his water. <coughs> and this is a multi-million dollar home in, in the Berkeley Hills, where the palatability of the water coming to the home, of course there's piped water, was not sufficient for that homeowner to, to drink that water. So he was buying water from a long ways away, probably from the same neck of the woods as Vanuatu, but maybe a couple islands over. You guys know the name of that bottled water. And the massive carbon footprint. And instead, now, those guys are heroes. They're not wasting that plastic. They're not creating that condition. They're, they're stopping it there. These two young ladies are extraordinarily special. Uh, they are part of uh, almost a thousand girls that have now been rescued by a woman named Josephine Clea into something called the Sambuwa Girls Foundation in northern Kenya. These are girls that have suffered from FGM and child marriage and other atro atrocities. They're brought in, they learn Swahili, English, get diplomas. There's a couple that have become doctors and lawyers. And those girls now don't have to walk two miles a day to the river that's laden with cholera through hyena infested land with men out there that see them as property. This is a school in Arizona. Top of a fire station in Utuado, uh, Puerto Rico, right after Hurricane Maria. And now there's a big um, uh, drought in Puerto Rico and, and uh, we're doing a lot there with the people and our partners there that are sort of helping us to make sure that those people can solve this problem for themselves. Now I want you all to focus on this little girl's chipping pink nail polish for a second. Just stare at that. That could be your daughter. That could be you. Look at her eyes now and her smile. This little girl is a Syrian refugee who, f who made her way to northern Lebanon. She's lost everything, her home, her country, maybe loved ones. She's got that beautiful pink nail polish that guarantees you that she's just like you and me. And she's got good water. We're now doing this in 23 countries from very dry places like the Australian continent to extraordinarily wet places like the Philippines to the Middle East and so on. Across a, a range of applications from schools to homes to banks to communities. Now, coming all the way back to Arizona, when I was putting this talk together, 
looking at the great seal state of Arizona under Detat Deus, you notice the five C's are there. There's the miner, represents copper, the cow in the lower right, that represents cattle, the citrus orchards, the uh, cotton fields, and then the sun and air representing the climate, the five C's. But there's a sixth thing in that picture. See all that water behind the dam and then the river? Not one of those five C's would be possible without that water. And that was made possible because sometime, a little over 2,000 years ago, some woman drug the edge of the river open and started agriculture. And then her brother drug it one more step over to start the next field. And then their uncle did the next one, eventually resulting in 20,000 kilometers of those canals. And the recognition by the settlers that there is this great bounty to be had in this place. So I'll leave you with this thought. If the land intercedes in your life in a profound way like it did in mine, you can do amazing things to lift people up, just like the Native Americans that came before. That's it. Thank you, guys.